Hello, everyone. Great to see you. Hello, everyone. So great to see you. Hi. <laughs> so, so excited to have um, Kim Singer talking to us today about one of those aspects that really has come up quite often around how do I really make the case for l and resources rather than always kind of like justifying or saying, oh, well, you know, please cut your budget by 20% and then just the assumption that we will do that. So Kim's really, we're excited to have her here about talking about how do we um, really make the case and have that behind us as we're arguing for what do we need in order to be actually effective in our role as L&D leaders. Thank you, Liz. And I'm, I'm glad to see um, Jennifer here as well. And I wanted to start with just, if you can see the quote at the bottom, find a job that you mm. love doing and you'll never have to work a day in your life. That to me is what this conference is all about, is this connecting job seekers and finding that career that you feel like you're not even working. And I feel like I have been so blessed throughout my many decade career that I really haven't worked that much because I love it. I love mm -hmm. what I do. I love empowering people. Awesome. I love connecting people with the resources that they need to be successful. And that's been the key of my entire career is connecting people to other people or connecting them to a resource that enables them and empowers them to be able to do their job. Jobs. Um, how many of you on the in the session today participated in Grant Brandon's keynote this morning? Click the little raise hand down at the bottom. <clears throat> Some of you heard that keynote. If you're if a raise hand or a little thumbs up, th thank you. Yeah, several of you. So if you remember, um, based on Brandon's session, and that we are in this accelerated pace to transform L and D. How much, what, what might, might be the impact if you did not get the resources that you needed? Or what could be the impact of getting the resources you have? Go ahead and post that up in the feed and start to chat because I know my L&D colleagues are not shy and they love to chat. <clears throat> Right, Terry, thank you. You're not able to meet business requirements and that's what we're gonna talk about. Well, fortunately, through many of the roles that I've had, one of the key responsibilities that I've had is being able to assess the resources and actually making a case for resources to be successful in my, uh, in my business. So feel free to continue your networking because that's what this conference is all about. If you want to say where you're, lo located, what interests you about this session. And then if we want to continue this conversation after this session, we can jump over to a table. So feel free to do that as well. I, pre I appreciate you being there. One of the things I was thinking about when I thought about this topic and I've entered an organization, and it could be that you entered an organization like this, is you may have walked into an organization or a business that has a plethora of learning resources or perhaps you're going in somewhere where the learning environment is pretty sparse and you don't have much at all. So either way, depending on if you have bundles and bundles of resources or no resources, it is you're gonna be your job probably to, at some point to ask for some resources and figure out exactly what you need that's gonna create the greatest impact. Well, I've been in both situations. I've entered an organization with practically nothing and built it up or with so many that some of my jobs was to clear the path and create a path so that I can get the learners to the appropriate resources. And what I found is if I could give you the number one thing that has helped me be successful in acquiring those resources is building the relationships is having a stakeholder sponsor relationship. The easiest acquisition of resources I've ever had was when I had a leader who I thought was absolutely phenomenal. I went to him, I built my business case, I had all the documentation, the financials, the need, et cetera, the gap analysis says, Kim, I don't need any of this. You're the expert in this area, just go buy it, regardless of how much money you know was. Just he um, immediately approved it. Now that would be a dream state, wouldn't it? But that was because of the relationship and the credibility that I had built in the few months that I had been there. But let's say you don't have that because many of us are entering into new opportunities, right? So what I would suggest to you, and I would feel free to tell me your stories in the chat if you can. And if there is Tracy St. John in the background, um, we wanna bring her to the stage if that's possible because she is a good case study for us. So Jen, if you're able to do that, that would be great. If not, I will um, try to catch her in chat. Her name's Tracy Hi. St. John. Yep, mm -hmm. I will find her. That would be awesome. But my first thing that I would suggest to you is really take a good inventory of the resources that you already have. I've walked into some places where there were technologies that were underutilized. 
there were analytics that I couldn't get my hands on, content, people, et cetera. But do you really know what you have? And we have a lot of tools to do that. You could do a SWOT analysis. You could um, just put it in a spreadsheet. It doesn't matter how you do it, but figure out what you already have. And if you go back to my previous toy picture, imagine you already have 300 trucks. And a child says, oh, I need a new truck. I need a new shiny truck. Well, what parent's going to go say, oh, yeah, let me buy you another truck when I see you're tripping over 300 trucks already right here. And that happens to some L&D people. You're not aware of the resources that already exist in your system because they're not always purchased through a centralized learning organization. The resources could have been purchased by engineering, accounting, HR, whoever they are, wherever those resources are. If you could figure out where they are, then that you might be able to better leverage and you don't have to ask for more. You just use the existing technologies, licenses and things that already exist in your organization. So consider that. Also figure out where you've got waste. When you determine how much waste were things that have been purchased and what are the costs of that waste? What if you were to cancel some of those memberships and now you can free up some resources to put them in some of these more innovative and, and um, interesting technologies. So that assessment and that inventory has been invaluable to me to know exactly where that is. I want to spend a few minutes too on some of the technologies. If I go through to the step step two in the technology stack, this is just a Burson image. But in your technologies, I wouldn't just go to straight learning software that you're looking at. We can leverage so many different types of technologies. And this is just one example. What is your ecosystem of technologies? How can you better leverage them? I found in my last organization, we were able to leverage a chat technology for communities of practice. If we, you know, an internal intranet chat feature that we found invaluable for problem solving and learning where it already existed. So how do we create groups and connect people to, to the issues so that I have similar common problems. And I'm talking about a very large global organization. Sometimes even when you're sitting in the same building, people aren't talking to each other about the problems. So if you start thinking about what technologies you can leverage, that's some L&D resources to quantify. And there's plenty. Anyone else find any resources there? Looking at my chat here. And Kim, while you're looking at the chat, um, uh, I sent a request for Tracy to come up on stage, but Tracy, you'll have to accept that. And it may be under your people um, icon. Oh, here she comes. Yay. Yay. Great. Thank you, Jennifer. You're so helpful. Sure. Awesome. Hey, the second topic that I want to move into as we're waiting also for Tracy to join us is how are you when you're thinking about the resources you two might need align with the business priority what's going on in the business and these are not linear by the way when I'm suggesting doing the inventory and the needs assessment sometimes you might want to just start right here if there is a business priority that absolutely requires you to, to invest and this past year we've all seen that haven't we there has been an urgent need to quickly move into an area where you have to align with the business need. Get your leadership, get your stakeholders and your sponsorship lined up, and then you'll have a better opportunity to discuss what the problem is and then find a resource to fulfill that. When I was talking with Tracy, who Tracy and I worked together on our last organization, I remember her just doing a phenomenal job with analytics and solving really big problems with the organization and capturing value in a unique way. So Tracy, are you able to um, share your story? I am. Can you all awesome. hear me? We can. Thank you, Tracy. Okay, fantastic. And I'm perfectly happy that I'm not on video. So that's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Jennifer. I did not see the uh, invitation in the background. So thank you. Uh, yes, I wanted to share. So yes, Kimberly and I did work together at uh, our previous company, uh, different, different organizations. I was actually embedded um, at our company, we embedded within our individual business units. So for, for me, I was embedded within the sales division. And so we identified a problem. Some of my senior leaders felt like our sales folks that were calling on our customers, like, you know, Target, Walmart, Kroger, um, were not getting the, the they were leave mo leaving money on the on the table so they weren't negotiating very well they weren't being assertive enough um 
so the hypothesis we bannered around was maybe nobody's had formal negotiation skills training. So we went on that hypothesis and we did a very quick survey to our team. There was around 150 of them and lo and behold, the hypothesis was right. So not very many had, had been through it either at our company or previous companies they had worked. So uh, our next task was to out to identify a vendor. We felt very strongly that we did not have the internal credibility um, and authority to actually t train on that. So we really wanted that from a, a CPG leading industry expert. So we found uh, an organization that does that, very well known. Um, they're kind of the leader in the space. So what I did along with my uh, VP was we ran through different scenarios or models of how many people do we want to put through this training, you know, it from just high potential leaders all the way to the whole organization and we ran through a bunch of different scenarios based on people investment of time investment of money so we ended up with three scenarios and our recommendation and kim you took one of my key takeaways the very first thing is to build strong relationships within your organization so they can support and advocate for you. And that was absolutely key because we brought on board, we first went to our, our CFO, our, our chief financial officer, because this was going to be a seven figure investment over three years. So we went to her, um, showed her the payout, what we thought we could get on a return on an investment with a range, right? You can't ever get the exact number, give them a range. Uh, so we had her support, uh, then we went on to the president. One of the other things we did was we incorporated their input and then we actually put them through the training as well so they could see uh, what it was all about. So like I said, it was a three year journey. We spread it out because it was such a major investment of time for our attendees. It was a three and a half day boot camp. essentially. It would go from eight in the morning till 10 at night. Uh, so it was rather intense. Um, and then after each group would go through their workshop, they would come in 90 days later, give or take, and share out the incremental gross margin that they feel like they achieved from having gone through the the training. So for instance, you know, they say, oh, I have this regular meeting with Kroger, and if I had not gone through the training, I would not have asked for X. So that would be the incrementality of the training. So we would tally up all of that and we would report that out to senior leaders periodically, usually like once a quarter or once every half a year. So after the program was over at the end of three years, um, this is phenomenal results. You can't, I, I've never had this kind of result either, but it's, it's pretty, you can understand why, but we've got a uh, 20X return on investment. So for very little, I mean, one, one particular negotiation could make you a million dollars in, in gross margin. So it was a pretty easy slam dunk, I guess, to make. But I would say my three key, key takeaways were the strong relationships, running a range of outcomes, because you'll never guess exactly what's going to happen, and then just commun uh, continuous communication with senior leaders. Isn't that yeah. terrific, Tracy? I thought they had such amazing responses for one particular resource. So that's why I really was appreciative that Tracy could tell that story. Um, I'm seeing, I, I love the comment that Terry's making here that she had 14 learning platforms. How many of y'all have been there, done that? Me too. Imagine being a learning leader and you have multiple platforms. You don't know where all your content is and you, you've got LMSs, learning experience platforms, uh, you know, all kinds of stuff. It's really hard to pull that all together. So how do you best leverage what you already have? I want uh, to share another example to build on what Tracy said. One of the organizations I went into, and this is maybe what some of you are dealing with with compliance, is in a very high risk and, and manufacturing environment, I was tasked with taking over all safety and compliance training in an organization of about a thousand people. And what I had discovered 
but in doing the inventory is that we weren't really clean on who needed what based on the risk factors that those people were exposed to and what, what was such a high risk that you needed more of a behavioral experiential activity versus maybe a lower risk that could be an e-learning or a knowledge-based activity. So we did that very thorough assessment over the course of about a month or two with our senior leaders. And we said, let's take a look at the roles and the individuals that you have and assess who's exposed to which risks. So we did a risk assessment so that we could determine what was the best opportunity for them to learn about these risk factors and mitigate those risks. Along with that, I assessed the content. We had been paying for content like you couldn't imagine. There was just content all over the place. So I discovered the best content and leveraged the best content. And then my subject matter experts weren't all on my learning team. They were across the organization, people who had expertise with that, those particular topics. As a result of that assessment, again, put it all together, went to my um, VP, CEO of the organization. I said, here's what I'm finding. And I'm thinking what I'm learning here is I'm going to need a safety a lead person in the safety area for my team. And he, again, he says, Kim, how long is it taking you? I thought, you know, you took way too long to even ask me for this. I was waiting for you to ask me when you needed some safety resources. But it's just my nature to build that business case before I went asked because I had to prove it to myself, not just to him, of this was the best decision and the best path going forward. So by putting that together and doing your assessment, and I'm talking quickly because we don't have time for a year long assessment, putting the assessments together, you'll be able to get the resources that are best for your, your learners, your, your coworkers. And in that case, with our safety. Okay, everybody, thank you so much for bearing with us. I think we're having a little bit of trouble uh, getting Kim back on. Uh, so what we're going to do is go ahead and uh, end the session and break right here for a little bit. Give everybody time maybe to get ready and join the session, uh, the panel discussion on the L&D state of the industry. And then we'll have Kim join us at a table um, for some table discussion at one to continue this conversation. So look forward to seeing you there and hearing more from Kim a little bit later. Thanks, everybody. Awesome. Thanks, everyone.